we decided as a part of our initiative to gain knowledge and then share knowledge with you to see ultimately are these LSW tires a yield crusher or is it going to help increase your yields? Is it going to give you an advantage over what would be a traditional dual setup? So we looked at two planning setups. One is what we'll call the 1100 LSW setup. That's a picture of the tractor we were studying. It was on a New Holland T8 380 tractor. And this tire was set up with the LSW 1040R32 tires on the front. And those tires were set at eight PSI to carry an axle weight of roughly 10,500 pounds. On the rear, this tractor had the LSW 1145R46 tires and they were set at 13 PSI to carry a rear axle weight of roughly 15,500 pounds. And this tractor was pulling a 16 row white central fill planter. It was actually a brand new planter uh, that he had got uh, over the winter. The other tractor we looked at was a 1400 LSW setup, which uh, when you're, if you can see that, it is really a beast of a machine. Um, and this was on a John Deere 8260R. This uh, tractor had on the front 1135R32 tires, and they were set at 13 PSI to carry an axle weight of roughly 12,000 pounds. And then on the rear were the 1430R46 tires. And the big difference here is this tire pressure was set at 25 PSI, and it had to carry an axle weight of about 48,000 pounds. And reason being, it was a three-point mounted planter, 30 row, 22 inch, and it also had, if we back up here, you can see it's got big fertilizer tanks on it. So maybe for a lot of you guys, this isn't what you have for a planter. Maybe you are running a pull type planter, central fill or box. So this was definitely a different setup to take a look at. And again, a lot higher air pressure. And if you can see in the picture, um, I tried to do this visual to scale. This tractor was driving over two rows with the 22 inch spacing versus the 1100 is only driving over one row. We aren't gonna to talk too much about this setup today. We wanna to spend our time focusing on what we saw with the 1100, which we think is more of a standard setup for growers. But I do wanna to touch on what we saw with this tractor. And there were positives, but there were definitely some negatives that we saw. Um, I think you can see in this picture pretty clearly that there are some tire tracks going through this bean field. And uh, the grower actually is here in this room today and he said I could point him out. Mike Koenig is over there. And I was talking to him and he said that he had about 80% of his fields were great. No pinch roll problems, but about 20% of them did see some issues. And this is one of them. He uh, doesn't know exactly what the cause of that was. A couple things that happened is that this was planted maybe a little bit too soon after a rain event. So the soil had a little bit more moisture and he also runs a roller over the field. And so it's possible that that also put some additional compaction on those pinch rows. But we can definitely see that there is some stand thinning, some uh, decreases in vegetative growth. And if we look at the roots in some of those more severe areas, we can clearly see a compacted root system. Whereas on the left is where the tire track was, flatter roots, on the right is where there was no tire track, and we can see the root development is definitely a lot better there. In corn, we didn't see near the negative impact. The root systems were slightly smaller, the stock girth was slightly smaller, but definitely not as severe as beans. Uh, there was a little bit of a reduction in stand in the wet areas, about 10%, um, but definitely not as severe in beans. We did some, we pulled some ear samples in some moderate areas, and actually the kernel counts from the samples we pulled were exactly the same. One thing we did notice though, is that the kernels aren't filled out quite as well in the tire track. They're a little shallower and a little bit lighter. So there would be a yield drag there, but not, not a ton and probably not as much as we were expecting. So with that tire setup, we, we actually were, going, we were talking with Mike Koenig over there to see if he wanted to switch back into a triple or a dual setup, and he actually said no. He said he wants to run with these tires again. He uses the tractor for tillage in the fall, absolutely loves them with that. 
Um, we are going to make some adjustments for this spring though. We're going to take some weight off of that rear axle. Um, potentially he may not be using the, the fertilizer tanks, so that'll also help decrease his uh, air pressure. Um, he may also just drop his road speed down a little bit so he doesn't have to have his tires aired up so high for road travel. So we're going to try and get his air pressure down a little bit. Um, based on what we saw with our studies today, if you're going to plant with an LSW tire, we'd like to see that air pressure, whether it's front or rear, below 15 PSI. Um, that way we don't run into those compaction issues, especially when you're getting into wetter, heavier soil. So that's a summary on the, the 1400 LSW setup. Now we're going to dive into the details on the 1100 LSW setup. And so the purpose of this study is not to compare duals versus singles versus tracks. Uh, that's something we would absolutely love to do, but it was beyond the scope of what we could feasibly accomplish last year. Uh, what we are trying to do is quantify the impact of planting with Goodyear LSW super singles on the pinch row. How are we quantifying? So in the study what we're doing is we're looking at the tire track. We're going to be taking samples from the tire track and then we're either taking a sample from right down the center of the tractor or right off to the side. So it's a side-by-side -side comparison of tire track versus absolutely no tire track. And we're looking at compaction levels, final stand counts, plant and root development, and then ultimately what the grower is concerned about, what's my impact going to be on yield? So um, again, I had Nate Furley help us with this analysis. He's the one who is out in the field with me and he will be speaking on what we saw. Hello. Get the right button sequence here, all right. So my name is Nate Fairley. I own and operate a company called Ag Revival based out of Gibbon, Minnesota. Uh, I founded the company four years ago now and our goal was just to simply provide data for growers to make better decisions. And um, one of the examples I love to give is last year we tested over 30 in furrow product combinations. Now, if you go according to the USDA, an average farmer has what, 36 decisions to make because he's gonna grow 36 crops. So you could try one every year, right? So our goal is to try and alleviate some of those variables, help make better informed decisions. So I'm glad that we're surrounded by a lot of tire experts because I'm not the tire expert, but I am soil and plant development. And this was a fun project to be a part of uh, because I've been getting a lot of questions about that, you know, um, especially around the pinch row, okay? And, and I think when we think pinch row, we think center fill planters, we think all that weight's on the planter, and we forget about the tractor that's pulling that planter, okay? So for example, um, you maybe have 22 inch rows, you got a track on a 48 row center fill, but you still see a pinch row effect, right? Is it from planting into that track, or is it because you have those triples or those duals? So there's a lot of questions around this. Um, this study was fun because we got to just go out and evaluate. Uh, when I got to the field with Matt, he said, here's the field, kind of go do your thing. And uh, I didn't ask where the planter track was. Uh, the, the whole goal was just to simply try and find it. Okay, now I cheated a little bit because I couldn't find it with the soil compaction meter. I could see the sprayer tracks. So not, most of us are spraying um, on those planter tracks. So uh, this is a good picture. This is actually part of that field. Um, but how many of us saw this last year? A lot of us, right? So there were a lot of issues with moisture, uh, especially the surface moisture. But what, what I look at when I see moisture isn't just the water, but it's the lack of oxygen in the soil. Okay, so we see a lot of things and essentially that's what compaction is, right? It's, it's squishing out that, that, those air pockets and alleviating the oxygen potential of the soil. So first I'll talk about the stand establishment. Once we uh, identified where the planter track was, and uh, then we could take our soil compaction meter, we did stand counts. Uh, we found that there was no difference in the stand, uh, maybe a little bit in the real high moisture area, which would have been on the outside of this. Um, so there was a little bit, but what we really found uh, was that we had the stand uh, there, the plant germinated, it grew, but we had, again, that lack of oxygen, so we had some phytophthora kick in. Um, so maybe a little bit more in that tire track, but we did find phytophthora in all 16 of the rows across that planter. Um, so when we looked at the average conditions on corn uh, and the high moisture areas, there's no significant difference in the stand. Plant root development, this is where it gets fun for me. 
because I like getting dirty, I like digging roots. You guys saw that picture of that soybean plant earlier, okay, that, that flat line, that pancaked root, that is severe compaction. If you see a tap root product or crop, like a sugar beet or soybean, that shows that compaction, you're dealing with a really high PSI when you're testing that compaction. Um, so we were looking for that because in my head I'm thinking we're planting into that tractor track, we're gonna have some of those issues. Um, but in soybeans, when we started digging roots, we didn't find a difference. Uh, if anything, what I felt like there was maybe more of a dispersion of that soil so that tap could get through. Um, and if we look at, I'm gonna bounce around a little bit here. But if you look at the soil compaction numbers, you know, we think that that's gonna have that effect. So typically when you see that pancake that we saw in the picture earlier, that's gonna be about 250 plus PSI at, at planting, at germination, okay? Then you'll see that carry all the way through. Now if you look at the chart, what's, what's the comparison here? We got 120 goes to 120, 140, 145, 150 to 215. The first two at three and six inches, no statistical difference, we get to nine inches and then we see that. And that's pretty typical because as we get heavy rains, as we get a lot of moisture sitting on that soil, at nine to 12 inches, we'll see those compactions throughout the season raise, they'll go up. Sorry for bouncing around too much, but going back to this picture, um, tire track versus known soybeans, this was nice to see because that tap, it blew through any kind of compaction that would have been there. So this was in those high moisture areas. We did see where, as we were walking along, there were maybe 10 or 20 foot sections where there was a little bit of a canopy difference. Uh, again, so I think there was maybe that 5% difference. Corn, slight disadvantage. Now, if you remember the corn root picture from the other tractor tire setup, compared to this one, there wasn't much of a difference. And here's, here's what I think on this. A, a corn plant typically wants to throw those brace roots out to brace itself and pull up a lot of that late season moisture and nutrients for kernel development. The plant really wants to get those lateral branches out. If there's any kind of stress, the plant's number one goal is to just shoot down. It's to shoot in to get down to that moisture and you can see there's just a little bit of a, of a coning effect where it's pulled in slightly. So now the compaction levels again, um, 120, uh, 140 to 145, 150 to 215, compared to you know, outside of the row we're at planting, there wasn't much of a difference. So, so again, I think what the numbers show us, and this is difficult because it, it can be difficult, this one was fun because we're comparing just simply planting into that row or into that tire track versus not. Now typically what we do in our research is we do replicated research. We're eliminating all variables possible and there's a lot of variables. We said it earlier, we'd love to test LSWs versus duals versus tracks. Uh, I, I don't know which one's better, I don't. We don't have the data on that, but what I can say is that we're spending a lot of money on planters. We're spending a lot of money in the precision technology aspect of it, and what we're doing there is what? We're trying to get that spacing, that depth, that stand establishment, and we gotta remember that in precision ag, it is the whole program, the whole program. It's not just one component. And so the tractor or the tires or the tracks, those are a component of that precision egg. So when some growers look at what configuration they're gonna have for ride durability, I look at it from an agronomy standpoint because that's where I'll make more money. That's where it's gonna give me my return. And so an average farmer, we've asked this questions years and years, and our conclusion is the average farmer stops every five hours to check his planting depth, okay? So every five hours he's gonna get out, we're gonna check that planting depth, make sure everything's riding good, we'll maybe check for some spacing, but how often are you stopping to check your PSI and your tires? I know we did it all year last year, not once. We did it at the beginning and then we ran them, okay? So we're, we're, we're kind of you know, running some farm boy research too, but, but again, it's that whole program, it's that whole system, so we have to look at every component, uh, component within it. Uh, yield, again, we were doing yield estimates. So um, we were doing some pod counts. Uh, we did pod counts. Uh, we looked at kernel density of that soybean and uh, our conclusion that in the row versus outside, uh, there wasn't going to be a difference there. On corn, we had the same kernel counts. I believe we got a picture. So here were the ears that were, that were pulling. And, and what I like doing in these field scenarios, 
I think Matt thought I was a little crazy. I told him to watch out because I like to throw things. I like to just throw my shovel. That's my, that's my variable alleviator, right? That takes the, the farmer out of me that wants to look for that one right spot to take the comparison. And so that's what we do. We throw, we throw a shovel. Uh, we take our, our one thousandth of an acre uh, measurement, stand counts, and then we'll take, typically I take uh, six, nine, and 12. Those are the years that I'll grab uh, along the way. So again, um, tire track versus no tire track, uh, no statistical difference. I think uh, Matt's gonna talk a little bit here. So uh, we do have, um, we just have a video playing in the back. It's just kind of, uh, just showing kind of our highlight reel from 2018 research. Uh, last year we had 150 acres of replicated studies and then we helped growers on farm do about 5,000 acres where they would set up a, we'd help them write the protocol, help collect the data at the end of the year to kind of take that next step. And what we, what we call replicated research is we're doing strip trials. So we're doing 250 to 300 foot trials uh, replicated four to five times. We do not publish a study unless we have three data points. So last year we lost about 40% of our research just based on that. Uh, which was a pretty big blow. We had 72 studies across 150 acres and, and we lost about 40%. So um, again, we're back there. We have some of the different things we're testing. So you guys, if you're interested, come by. Come grab a book. We did bring some research books. We have some copies left, so feel free to take one of those. Um, again, this was a fun study. It, it just, it's really, it's a topic that, that I want to continue to pursue because again, when you look at that precision, it's the whole program, it's everything. It's not just the one component. Uh, so think about the tractors, think about your tires, think about your soil, oxygen. Uh, it all has a lot to play with it. Thanks. Thank you, Nate, and don't go too far in case there's questions. Um, so one thing that we couldn't do is something that a dealership could do with Titan uh, down in Iowa. In 2016, they did a side-by-side -side comparison comparing a traditional 480 radial dual setup to the Goodyear LSW 1100 setup. So what Nate just talked about, they took that exact setup and did a replicated research trial uh, down in Iowa. And this setup was used with uh, two identical tractors, two identical planters, and they, they alleviated, alleviated a lot of those variables that Nate was talking about. And what they saw with that study is a six bushel per acre increase on soybeans and a five bushel per acre increase on corn. And I'll let you run the numbers on that, but we didn't get to take our study to, to yield to figure out what the exact yield difference was. So we can only go based on kernel counts, plant development, and what we saw. Um, but knowing what we see with the traditional dual setup and oftentimes a pinch row problem there, uh, we, we certainly think that something along these lines is within the realm of what an LSW tire could do. So with that, uh, I'll open it up for questions. Nate will answer, I'll answer, and then if you have product questions, we can nab one of the sales guys too. Maybe I should stand up here, that'll intrigue more questions. <laughs> here. No, again, I just want to reiterate that fact that um, I know I'm probably getting in between you guys and lunch here, but it's better than between the tire and the ground. Uh, but I do, uh, I do want to reiterate that fact that it is the agronomy approach. You know, I think that's what's a little different here. When you look at the booths that are here, it's, it's the equipment and then there's this random agronomy company stuck in there. Um, but I think the, the, the whole thing is that's where we make money. I farm too. So I've, I've got farm uh, acres beyond the research and that's where we really look at where can we make our money because in these economic times, maybe we can't afford to go to that track tractor that we want to go to. Um, but one thing we can do that's no cost is just simply running the proper PSI in the tractor that we have. What's the application that we're using it for? That's one start, that costs us no more money. And then maybe the upgrade is going to a different tire configuration and then maybe someday get to those tracks. So, so I think I just want to reiterate that fact that it's an agronomy approach that we're looking at. Um, I'd say stay tuned. I, I hope we can get into more, some more of these projects. Uh, we do a lot of product testing, but last year we've expanded into the equipment side of things, so we hope to continue to venture down that, that line. So again, any more questions? Yeah. When seed corn companies are investigating like their yields, are they looking at how much compaction there is, even though it's not planted? 
fight for the tiger tracks are? Yeah, so good question. The question was, are C-Corn companies looking at compaction or testing different varieties or, or pedigrees? So my background is I worked 10 years for a seed company uh, as, an, as an agronomist covering Minnesota and Iowa. Um, and we did not look at that. And actually, most times, it was a plant for Harvest Center 2 scenario. So that's where we were capturing our yield was right in that area. And what we found is, when you look at like rootworm, for instance, conventional corn companies are now breeding their corn to have a really aggressive lateral branching nodal root structure because you get away from that furrow. And that's where you have most of your rootworm feeding is right in that furrow. They travel the path of least resistance. Well, think about the same thing. If, if you're in a pinch row setting and that corn plant is relying on a really aggressive lateral branching structure and it can't, or it's forced to go down, that could be a 15, 20 bushel decrease to that pedigree. And so you may have a, a skewed, you know, a skewed number because that pedigree isn't going to do as strong in that testing scenario. So I do, I do not think that the companies are looking at that and it's simply just a, an equipment uh, limitation. So good question. Thanks. All right. Thank you guys.